Unfortunately, I've got my tea with me tonight. We're doing a little bit of chai. Nice little Peromi tea. Got caffeine free, so don't worry. I may, well, I'll probably be a little off the wall still because it's 11 o'clock at night and I'm filming video, but uh, won't be quite as caffeinated. <laughs> What's shaking bacon? I'm Joni, welcome to my studio. This is where I do food photography and that's what this channel is all about. So if you are into that, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. But meanwhile, somebody wrote in, Natasha Wise, left a comment on a video and said, can you do a video on all of your must have equipment? P.S. Love your channel. Well, thank you so much, Natasha, and absolutely. So that's what I'm doing here today. I'm gonna to talk about all of my must have equipment. Now, any of you who know me and watch me go on rants on my Instagram stories, you know that I am a firm believer in less is more. So when it comes to equipment, I don't believe in needing a whole bunch of stuff and spending a whole lot of money, especially when you're starting out. It's kind of like a runner, right? Like you go out and you get some super hyphy, high performance shoes, but you haven't trained at all, you're not gonna go any faster. Whereas if you legit trained and then you go get those hard core shoes then yeah you're gonna like kill them so it's just the same with photography that you could get all this fancy gear and equipment but it ain't gonna make a whole hill of beans if you don't know what you're doing with it so what are the essentials well of course a camera is super important and maybe you've already got a camera and that's why you're here and you're like I need to figure out how to use this thing in which case definitely love what you've got embrace it enjoy it if you haven't bought something yet and you're looking to buy something well I'm not gonna tell you to go with a particular brand but do know that whatever brand that you pick that you're gonna probably stick with for the long haul. Now, of course, I'm a terrible example of that because my first camera was Nikon and then I went to Sony, but now I'm too deep in Canon. I've got two different Canon cameras, so perhaps there's hope for me, but I can't make up my mind to save my life. So, you know, I'm a lost cause, but most people like to stick with one brand throughout the lifetime. It is a much more cost-effective way to go about this whole photography thing. So as far as what brand to go with, you know, you can definitely go to your local photography camera store and go try them out, experiment with them. You can even rent equipment today, which is an awesome solution. And you can really kind of see you know where you feel the most comfortable for me personally I have felt the most comfortable and at home and have liked the images the best out of my Canon cameras and that's why I have stuck stuck with that line but here's what I want you to bear in mind as you're making decisions about your cameras and first and foremost is that whatever lenses you buy for that camera that they can upgrade along with your photography journey because lenses can get expensive and it's great to be able to buy lenses that can stick with you as you upgrade your cameras so for for example, I had Canon 70D, which I've shot with for two and a half years. I have shot cookbooks with this. I have done a lot of paid work with this thing, but it is a crop sensor camera. So we're talking crop sensor versus full frame. I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty of that, but what you do need to know is that the lenses are different between the two. And so on a crop sensor camera in the Canon world, there's other classifications when it comes to Nikon, Sony, whatnot but your crop sensor camera on a Canon is gonna be an EF-S, that is the naming convention, and those lenses will only work on other crop sensor cameras. So if you upgrade to full frame, which is a more expensive body of camera, that you are gonna need EF lenses. But now here's the beauty. A crop sensor camera can shoot with EF lenses. So as I was buying lenses for my crop sensor camera, I was purchasing EF lenses because I knew I wanted those lenses to be able to translate once I did get to the point where I upgraded to a full frame camera, which I recently did. And it was, I mean, I cry. I literally cried when this camera showed up in my house. But again, you don't need a fancy several thousand dollar camera in order to produce amazing food images and to do a lot of really great work. So then moving on to number two essential, I'm gonna tell you to go out and get a diffuser. Now, you can of course purchase a diffuser and I have linked one below along with everything else that I'm talking about within this video. Link that all down in the description box below so you can grab that. It is super affordable, $20. It folds up like those, you know, those window covers for your car, same sort of idea. And it is a beautiful way to diffuse light and diffusers. We're going to do a whole video on diffusers. So don't worry about that, but just know they are going to be super helpful. And if you have been shooting for a while and you're not using one, 
you go buy one and you just watch and you see the magic happen. Because what a diffuser is doing is it's taking the light that's coming through that window or whatever your light source is and it's breaking it up into these beautiful soft particles. I'm actually using it, it's right here, it's right here right now. And so you can see we don't have any harsh like hard lines, right? Like it's soft shadows. So it's going to make really beautiful food images and you're able to more accurately control the light if you have a diffuser. And so you can purchase a diffuser or you can do what I did for a good long time, like at least my first year of professional shooting in my studio. I had a rolling rack, right? Like one of those clothes hanger racks and I had a white sheet over it and that was my diffuser. You can also hang a white curtain in the window. You can put up parchment paper. I mean, there are a ton of cost-effective solutions, ways that you can diffuse the light, but I do like having a diffuser that then I can put on a stand, which I'll also link a stand along with some little grip mounts and things that can help hold it in place because I like to move it around. I don't like to be restricted to a particular place, right? So having a diffuser that's on a stand, then I can move it around, position it where I need it and get that light looking, oh, so beautiful. Now staying within the same theme of controlling lighting because really that's that's what a photographer does right like you operate a camera but more importantly you manipulate the light you're painting with light and shadows and so in order to further manipulate light and shadows you go get yourself some black poster board and some white poster board and again this will be a part of a later video and I'll show you exactly how to do it but black poster board black black in general you put it to the side of anything you're shooting and suddenly you'll see you play with this and you just see what happens you're gonna create shadows in areas because it's gonna suck up that light right black sucks it up so it's going to suck up that light and create some nice shadows for you in certain parts of your image and in the opposite way that white then is a bounce card and you've seen me do this over in my natural light food photography video and if you haven't seen that i'll be sure to link that right up here so you can grab that here on the card but you can take the light that's coming through the window and say you need to fill out and just round out a little light it's a little too dark here on the side just put the white card there, bounces it right back, fills it in, softens things up, everything's perfectly lit, your money. And then gear wise, the other thing that to me is super important, I actually didn't use this for, oh my gosh, first six months to a year of shooting, I didn't have one of these. And as soon as I started using it, holy bejeepers, change the game. It's having a tripod. Pretty much any time I'm shooting food now, I am shooting on a tripod. When I shoot portraits, I'm running around and I'm freehanding it. But if I'm doing food, I'm on a tripod. First and foremost, because then I can be very intentional about where I am setting the focus, especially if I'm dealing with a really, you know, wide open, little narrow depth of field on the aperture. I want to be able to specifically place where that's going. And the best way to do that is by having your camera on a tripod. And two, it really Really helps if you need to really dial back your shutter speed to something really slow because say for example it's a cloudy day which I mean here in Arizona I live for cloudy days because it is sunny all the time and clouds are a really great natural diffuser right like they're spreading those light particles that you're not getting those direct rays of the Sun right the clouds are diffusing it just like a diffuser does but it is limiting the amount of light that's coming through those windows so it's creating a darker exposure so in order to get the right aperture that you're looking for and you know not bump up your ISO too much you can really dial back that shutter speed but you cannot do that if you're not on a tripod because a tripod is allowing you to go into those slower shutter speeds while holding the camera really still we talked about that in the shutter speed video that if you are freehanding it I mean I personally don't go lower than 1 over 60 if I'm freehanding without a tripod because otherwise it's just gonna be shaky and you know I remember one of my very first page shoots uh, and I was so nervous nervous oh I mean I still get nervous <laughs> I was especially nervous because it was the first one of the first times getting paid to take pictures and I remember coming home and looking at the images and just being disappointed because they were all a little bit blurry because I was really trying to nail the exposure but I had that shutter speed too slow for being manual for being handheld that a tripod really would have saved those images because it's holding that camera perfectly still and two if you get a tripod like I've got which is a bit more of an expensive model but what I will tell you is having an indestructible tripod is a really helpful thing because again it is something that I use every time I use my camera pretty much I mean it is a daily use item it gets beat up it gets moved around so it is one of those things that I will tell you it is good to spend a little bit more 
more money to get a good tripod because I did have a crappy tripod when I first started out and when I finally upgraded to something really nice it's just a lot more stable it's not flimsy and two like the one that I've got which a lot of other models do as well you can take the arm and you can do it over sideways so that suddenly you're you're directing traffic no <laughs> not directing traffic that you can in effect turn it into a C stand right so that you can mount it overhead and get those overhead shots without having to invest in an extra C stand right that's additional equipment that you just don't need so a really great tripod that can do overhead it's a two for one deal all right so we talked about the camera we talked about diffusers talked a little bit about lenses now but I didn't tell you which lenses to buy because honestly you should stick with the kit lens to start don't go spending a bunch of money please just don't spend your money I don't want you spending a ton of money uh, stick with the kit lens for a while but what you will start to get frustrated with the kit lens is if you're trying to go into those lower apertures right shooting wide open you want to get those really nice fuzzy ethereal pictures you're gonna need a lens that's able to go down that far and so the one that so many photographers will tell you, both food photographers, portrait photographers, any photographers anywhere for the most part are gonna tell you the Nifty 50, which is a 50 millimeter 1.8 lens. And the best part about this lens, it is not expensive. It is all of $125. I just checked, I confirmed, yes, $125. And in the world of lenses, that is very inexpensive. I will just tell you from personal experience that is very cost effective. And truth be told, you can do an entire shoot with a Nifty 50. You can do overhead shots and you don't have to get super high up. You can get some really great portraits. You can do some good close-ups. You can get so much with a 50 millimeter lens. And the other great thing about 50 millimeter is that you don't get the distortion on the edges like you'll get with a wider angle lens. So something like a 24 millimeter, 18 millimeter, you start to see just sort of like that bowing that happens on the edges. I mean, it's not like straight up fisheye or anything, but if you notice that, you're not gonna get that with a 50 millimeter. A 50 millimeter is a really true picture of an image. So if you are at the point of buying a lens, go with the 50 millimeter, 1.8. You're gonna look at the 1.2 and you go, oh my gosh, why am I gonna spend $1,300 versus $125? And I'm gonna tell you, don't. I mean, personal preference, right? If you wanna go spend that money. But for me, I really don't go lower than 1.8 in terms of aperture. Just because for me, I really start to feel like I'm losing the food if I go with too narrow depth of focus, right? If you go super narrow and you're looking at a burger, then you're just getting like this razor thin piece of the burger. Whereas, I, you know, I want more of the food. I don't wanna lose the subject. So for me, I really rarely, I mean, I share my settings with you guys over on Instagram. You'll see I rarely go below 1.8. Eight, very rarely and that's actually because I don't own any 1.2 lenses <laughs> all right so we talked camera we talked lenses we talked diffusers we talked bounce and black cards and we talked about tripods I think that's about it those are the basic essentials those are the things that can take you like super far in food photography you could essentially never add additional items to that now of course there's the world of artificial light which we're not going to talk about today because that is not an essential that is not a basic you have the the sun the sun is free but don't worry a lot of you have been asking about artificial lighting and so we will get into that very very soon and that's why you have to hit the subscribe button right because you got to stick around for more videos and other fun here in my studio now I know that was a lot of information all at once and you probably have a bunch of questions. So feel free to leave those below or hit me up over on Instagram. I'm happy to answer your questions or you can email me. I have all of the information that we have discussed linked below. I think, I hope, I don't know, I'm really bad at this, right? Like I get so excited to post a video and then I forget to add the links and there's inevitably something missing. So if I've forgotten something, just leave a comment. I'll make sure to send you the link. But I would be remiss if I didn't end this video by telling you don't go and spend a lot of money get started with what you have it is better to work through difficult situations with limited equipment and push through and make yourself a stronger photographer so that when you are ready and you are making real live money that you can actually go spend on equipment and additional gear that you know how to use it and that you're dangerous with or without it and that you could be in any scenario and still take amazing pictures of food and so with that um, I hope you have a fantastic day I hope you stay out of trouble. I hope you take a lot of pictures because that's the only way to get good at this, right? Take a lot of pictures and I'll see you later. All right, bye.